We're going to be in Psalms 23 today, so you can turn there. Yeah, so Crete beat McCook on Friday night. Yeah, I wonder that that hasn't happened for a few years. So McCook is usually one of the usually they're at state football and stuff like that. So that, uh, we could hear ki- we just got home. We had to go up to Lincoln for something, but as we got back, we could hear everybody cheering. It's kind of like, oh, we must have won the game, and we did. So yeah, that's pretty cool. Pretty cool. I don't know how far a lo- drive that is. Is it like five, six hours? Yeah. It's four hours, five, four hours? Yeah, it's a long drive. So I know we, there's been times we have to drive out there, so amen. Well, hey, um, Psalms 23, you know, that's just a favorite psalm for many, for many believers, isn't it? Psalms 23. Um, it's read in a lot of different occasions, sometimes just a, a time of comfort. As, as a pastor, there's many times that I'll read that, maybe sometime at somebody's bedside, you know, they're recovering. There's times that I, I you know, funerals, uh, celebration of life services, it's there. Psalms 23, I think, was a, um, it's a favorite of those that are, are uh, in harm's way, that are in our military, right? Uh, when they're going out to, to battle or on a mission. Um, Psalms 23 is a pretty common one. In fact, you watch some of the old war movies, you'll, you'll see them reading that, or some of the soldiers that are quoting that as they go into battle. Um, that God would protect them. There's an Amazon movie that came out. I think it's called Greyhound. Tom Hanks is the, is the lead actor on that. It, it was one of those movies that Amazon just produced itself. It came out, I think, this past winter. It actually is a very good movie, but it's based upon a true story of a captain, uh, a naval captain that was a God-fearing man, and, and um, he, he seemed to know um, Psalms 23 was a pretty important thing to him, but he, you know, that, that's woven into the movie a little bit, just how he just really trusted God to lead and protect them, um, just as they were encountering the German U-boats and all that type of thing, and uh, uh, so it's a great movie. Amen. So, so far we've looked at, uh, just kind of coming out of summer, going back into school, we've looked at Psalms 10, that was a prayer of justice, we just talked about things in Afghanistan, and um, Psalms 22, the Psalm of the Cross, that was last Sunday, and um, so today, Psalms 23 follows right after that Psalms of the Cross. So a lot of the Psalms were written by who? David, right? Not all of them, but a good portion of them are written by David, and then there's other authors, and, and so they're, they're combined, they weren't put in a, the, you know, th- at some point somebody put them in an in in order, okay? arranged them in order. It's not chronological order or anything like that, but they were arranged in, in, in a certain way. And so Psalms 23 does follow after 22, and um, it's just a psalm of confidence, of closeness to God. Um, so what you might not know, the backstory of Psalms 23. Does anybody know the backstory of Psalms 23 when David wrote this? And um, I don't even know if I, I don't think I knew this, so I was doing my my preparation, and one of the commentaries pulled it out, and then I picked it up in another one as well, that uh, most scholars believe that David wrote this during the time that Absalom was trying to take over the kingdom. So if you read into Second Samuel chapters 14 through 17, so that's your homework for this afternoon or this evening, is to go read the story of, of David. So David becomes king of Israel, and things are going well, but he gets into the latter years of his life. His kids are now adulthoods, and kind of a dysfunctional family, and part of that was due to David's sin, right? He, he sins with Bathsheba, and there's other things that happen in David's life. Um, he was a good king to, to some degree. He was a man that loved God, but he also made his mistakes, and I don't know if he was necessarily the best father, all right? Just because you're Christian doesn't mean that you're always the best father. We have to grow into that. And uh, so one of his sons was Absalom, and there's just a lot of dysfunction there. I mean, if you kind of read back, you'll find that Anon raped his sister Tamar, and then who was Tamar was Absalom's sister, and that, of course, upset Absalom, and eventually Absalom arranges for Anon to be killed, and... and, um, and then that meant that then Absalom was kind of pushed away from David, wasn't allowed back into the kingdom. Well, eventually he's brought back. But David never really embraces Absalom. And then there kind of begins this, Absalom was handsome, all right? 
he would be on all the magazines that have, you know, the guys there, you know. He had this long hair. In fact, it, they even put it in there, weighed like 10 pounds or something like that. His hair was just so full and stuff like that. He had this beautiful hair. He was a handsome guy. Everybody, and he was just good with people. Everybody loved Absalom. And it was at a time where people were, had some grievances with David's leadership. And so Absalom would sit at the city gates and he would kind of listen to people and make them feel important. Before you know it, Absalom begins, begins to gain popularity. And it's kind of a coup that takes place. Um, Absalom arranges it so he is crowned king and David has to flee for his life. And, and so um, it's, as David is fleeing with some of his army, some of the people that are closest to him, he flees into the desert. And it's there that he finds out, God, you are my shepherd. And you know what? Even in the, in the difficult moment, in the presence of his enemies, God was going to provide for him. So that's what we're going to talk about this morning. Amen? So sometimes to understand that backstory is pretty important to understanding the psalm. So let's look to the Lord in prayer this morning and we'll begin. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to greet, uh, just to, to meet and to be together, Lord God, and to, to honor you. And so, Father, let your word come alive. Let it change and transform us, challenge us, Lord. Let it draw us closer to you. We give you the thanks. We ask it in your name. Amen. Psalms 23, verse 1 says, The Lord is my shepherd. All right. You know, David was a, a shepherd, wasn't he? That's what he grew up being as a young man. In fact, it would be in that setting that God would anoint him king. And so Samuel comes to the house and he meets with all David's older brothers. And Samuel says, nope, none of these are the person that are to be the next king of Israel. Do you have anybody else? Well, yeah, there's David. He's out taking care of the sheep, right? And so they bring him in and God says he's the one. So David understood what it meant to be a shepherd. And he was a good shepherd because just a hired man, if a wolf came by or a bear, it's kind of like, okay, am I going to take on the bear or am I going to defend the sheep or am I going to run? And it's kind of like, okay, I'm going to run, right? But a good shepherd would stay and fight off the bear, fight off the wolf, protect the sheep. He would even lay down his life for the sheep. In fact, Jesus said what? He is the good shepherd that was willing to lay his life down for the sheep. So David understood this idea of a shepherd. You know, it, it's not, um, David uses a lot of names for God. He, he's, he calls God his rock, his shield, his fortress, his strong tower, his strength. Um, pretty long, extensive list that David will refer to God as. But probably the most endearing and most... Um, intimate of the metaphors he uses is that the Lord is my shepherd, right? Because there's a relationship there and closeness. Um, a shepherd lives with a flock and is everything to it. It's A shepherd is the guide, the physician, and the protector. So we're going to talk a little more about that. All right, you know, calling God our King and our Savior maybe has a better ring to it, but the shepherd metaphor is definitely more endearing. All right, so let's look at the first point here. It says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not lack anything. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me. Uh, we'll stop at there. He refreshes um, my soul. All right. So what does that mean that um, he makes me to lie down in green pastures? What does that mean? Now, some translations tone that down a little bit, such as the New Living Translation, it, it says it, he lets me rest in green meadows. And I think that's more the idea. The idea was that the shepherd would take his flock to a place where the pastures were green. They were lush. So there was food, there was nourishment, they were comfortable, and then the sheep would rest. Now, if he took them to a barren pasture that was overgrazed or just dry and rocky, not very comfortable, right? And there, there he might say, oh, get down, sheep, lay down. But the idea is that he was providing an environment that was inviting to them, and they would have the opportunity to rest and to be nourished. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. So it's not 
so much forcing them, but providing the idea to cause them to lay down, recline, and rest. Now, I don't have any sheep, okay? Surprise, I don't have any sheep. Now, if we had Rex here this morning, I don't think he has sheep, but he does have goats, but I think he just sold his goats and stuff too. Um, But he understands that. He's probably our closest version of a shepherd here in our congregation. So I don't have sheep, but I do have a yellow lab, okay? Now, sometimes I think he thinks he's a sheep, okay? But, you know, so I'm when we have him in an area that's kind of fenced in on our patio, but then when I'm out by the fire pit or we're in the yard working, he gets to go out in the grass. And he'll just get out there, and what does he love to do? He likes to get in the grass, and he just rolls in it. He gets on his back. He just rolls in it. He has a blast, and he'll just lay there, right? I don't have to tell him to lay down. He just lays, and he just loves to lay in the grass, right? He even likes to eat it. So he maybe is a sheep, okay? I don't know. Um, But the idea is there that when the conditions are right, he enjoys it, right? And see, God is our shepherd. He wants to provide us times to lead us into times where our soul is refreshed, it's restored, right? And uh, David saw that, that even in a difficult moment of his life, God was going to provide the conditions where his soul could find rest and renewal. That's hard to do sometimes when you're thinking about things, you're anxious about things. We turn on the news and we see all the things happening into the news. Um, that, did you know that can make you angry? I, I think sometimes what the worst thing to do is to turn on the news in the morning because, you know, it's like sometimes you can just go to work angry. It's, what are you angry about? I don't know. I'm angry, right? But we, we can take all that stuff in and it affects us. We, we lose sight of all the good stuff that maybe God is doing in our own life, right? Um, allow God to refresh you, maybe in your prayer time and devotional time in the morning. Let God quiet your heart and your soul. David also says he leads me beside still or quiet waters. And the idea there was that sheep could drink at a stream, okay? If there was a raging river, they'd be, they could be swept away, right? It would be difficult for them to get at that. If it was a stagnant pool, you know, who wants to drink at a stagnant pool that has moss and, you know, stuff all over? The idea was this gentle flowing stream that had water that was oxygenated, it was fresh, it was alive, and it would refresh them. And, uh, and bring them back to life. And then David says, he restores my soul. And this literally means that he brings life back to me. It means to restore vitality, vigor, strength, renewal, to invigorate, to make new again. David says, you know what? God does that for me. He's my shepherd. And if this is written during his escape from Absalom, he had to be weary. He had to be exhausted. And he's torn because he loves his son, but now his son is trying to kill him, right? And uh, in the midst of that, God is able to restore him and to refresh him spiritually. That's pretty powerful, folks, because that means if God could do that for David in a difficult moment of his life, that in your difficult moments when life is kind of crazy, God can give you that green pasture. He can give you that still water to refresh your heart and soul. And next he says that even he leads us along along right paths, intended to bless us. You know, we go to God's word and it's a lamp to our feet and a light unto our path. And and sometimes we can look at, oh, God doesn't want me to do this. He doesn't want me to have fun, da-da-da-da-da, right? No, it's the opposite. God wants to bless your life. That's why he's given us his word. Now, you can go and do your own thing. You can do what the world says is fun. And it may be fun for a season, but I can guarantee it's going to cost you. It's going to cost you. There's a price to pay, and it comes back to bite you. God wants to bless our life. And God cares about our physical well-being. He cares about all of us, our whole being. So the physical well-being, the green pastures, our emotional well-being, the still waters, our spiritual well-being, He refreshes our soul. And our moral well-being, He leads us along right paths. God is holistic in His provision for us. So if you're taking notes... Point number one, I'm getting to it at the end here, is that the good shepherd is our provider. And as I say provider, I mean it in that very holistic sense. Our body, our soul, our mind, God wants to refresh us. And, you know, this isn't a psalm just to refer to when times are tough. It is something I believe that God wants, intends for us each and every day as we go to God. Amen? The Lord is our provider. 
He cares about our whole being and we'll be blessed beyond measure like David and we'll say, you know what, I lack nothing even during a difficult moment in time. You know, and I think about, I've been getting, looking at some reports just of Christians that are maybe uh, stuck in Afghanistan and some weren't able to get out and others are choosing to stay in Afghanistan even though it may cost them their life. Why are they choosing to stay? Because if ever, all the Christians leave, who's going to, Who's going to be there to share Christ? Isn't that just a bold statement? Um, they do need our prayers, folks. Um, they are brothers and sisters in Christ, and uh, we need to keep them in our prayers. I believe that God can watch over them, which kind of leads into verse number four. Um, that even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will what? Fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now, it literally doesn't say in the valley of the shadow of death. It says in the darkest valley. But often we interpret that to mean the darkest valley of our life is when death is looming around us, right? That is the darkest. And so there are times that I've read this when somebody's at, you know, bedside there, right? And their life is in the balance, all right? You read this because um, it's just an assurance there. You know, and what, what's so comforting, I've seen people on the edge of death, and I've seen some that are just scared to death. I've shared this before, but there was a neighbor across the street in the first community we pastored, and um, he was uh, another faith that doesn't believe in Christ. And I, I got to know him. We would talk from time to time, but I think he was dying of cancer, if I remember it correctly. Uh, it was quite a few years ago. But as that onset happened, um, and he was just in the final days of his life, the fear that filled his eyes was just, I mean, it left a huge impression on my, upon my life. I mean, he was scared to death, and it was just obvious by his, his look, by the look in his eyes. And then I've seen other people that pass into eternity with the peace of God in their heart. There's no fear, right? Right? because they know where their heart is, they know where they're going to be when they pass into eternity. There's no fear there. Um, God's presence is with us. So um, the idea is that David is saying, you know what, there's those moments that we walk into the dark valley, the dark ravine. Why is that scary? Why is that darkness so scary? I don't know what's going to come out and get us, right? A bear, a lion, um, an enemy could be there to get us. We don't know what's waiting for us in the darkness. We can't see. But David says that even then, the sheep can pass through that moment in time because they sense the presence of the shepherd. They feel his rod and his staff. Now, the rod was used for fighting off wild animals, okay? It was a, maybe like a bat that they used to do that. And, and, the, and the staff was for guiding, right? It was for guiding and directing the sheep. It was also for walking for the shepherd. But it was to help guide them. And so they would maybe sense the presence of that, that, um, that staff alongside of them and say, no, you need to get back on the path. And that was a reminder, hey, the shepherd is with me. I'm safe. I'm secure. You know, there are times when we walk through that dark valley and we, don't get, we can't see God, right? But we do have evidences reminders of his presence with us and that he's walking with us. Amen? And his rod and his staff will protect us. And so secondly, the good shepherd is our protector. He's our protector. God is watching out over your life, whether it is, um, whether it is COVID, whether it is the other things in life, God's watching out over your life. And I believe that with all my heart. He's watching over my life. He's watching over your life. Uh, he is with us. Now, one of my, uh, I think I've maybe shared this a few times, but one of my scariest moments in life of walking in the dark was up in Alaska, all right? And it was, it was a few years ago. Um, I think I was living in North Dakota at that point, and I went up. So I, I moved up to Alaska my junior year of high school, right in the middle of my junior year of high school. Not the most ideal time, but... It happened, right? Went up there, and then I came back f during the summers and stuff for um, for work, and then eventually just moved on to North Dakota. We pastored there. But I came back, 
um, up to Alaska was in September. So it was right at this point because up in September in Alaska is it's moose season, all right? That's when moose season is, all right? And so that's kind of like a national holiday up there, all right? Go out and get your moose. And so I, I went up there. I'd never been moose hunting. I got my share of fishing for king salmon and red salmon up there, but I never got a chance to go moose hunting. So I went up there with my dad, and we, went, we, we packed up and took horses back up into the mountains, and we stayed in this cabin. So this cabin just had bunk beds with no mattress. You just had to put your sleeping bag on there, and if you had any padding or anything like that. And we stayed there, and ne kind of next to a lake. It was really pretty. I mean, beautiful, beautiful place. And um, we went hunting, and, you know, you're walking through these mountains, and there's all these alder trees. So the alder trees are, you know, they're not much taller than this, the ceiling. Or, you know, they're not really tall, but they're more of a, a bush type of thing. And they're really thick. And so you'd have to walk through these places. I mean, once you got through that alder patch, then most, most of the time it was just open space. And the blueberry tree, the bushes were up there. You could pick wild blueberries up there really good. So, um, But you'd see the path there. So you'd see moose tracks, but you would also see what other kind of tracks? Brown bear tracks, okay? And I would see them all over the place, all right? I was seeing them, but I wasn't seeing any brown bears. We did see some black bears. Uh, we didn't see any brown bears, but the evidence was there, folks. <laughs> they, uh, they had their tracks there. So whenever you walk through those alder trees, it's kind of like, you know? And I didn't have a gun, I don't think. Maybe I had a shotgun. I don't know if I had anything or not. Um, but the one day, it rained all day, and we hadn't really seen any moose. We were just seeing sign. We hadn't seen any moose. And it rained all day, but as evening came, um, the rain let up. And so we decided to hike up the mountain right behind the cabin. So we, we went up there, went up, and we did see some cow moose initially, and so, but no bulls. And so we began to work our way down. While as we're coming down, I look over there and I see a moose. And I stand behind the evergreen tree and I see antlers on both sides of the evergreen tree. And so I, I got my dad's attention. He went over there. And, um, you have to make sure they're big enough, you know. They have to be 48 inches wide, you know. So you have to take the tape measure up to them and say, okay, are you big enough? No. <laughs> you have to kind of judge it a little bit. Um, anyway, he, he, he got it. We got it out. But guess what? Now it's dark, right? It is dark. And so we take out the tenderloins on the inside there. And we begin to make our way off the mountain in the darkness, right? And so we had the lake to the right, so that was kind of, you could see kind of the moon shining off of there. You could see a little bit. But here I am carrying fresh meat, walking down the mountain in the dark. And I know that there's bears out there, right? And uh, that was probably one of the most scariest moments in our life. We did make it back, and uh, we had supper that night. And, but that was a scary moment. That was my darkest valley moment right there, right? Um, but you know what? God is with us in those times. He'll help us through that. Amen? Number three, verses five and six. It says, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Here David shifts from God being his shepherd to God being his host. And he goes into this banquet and he is the guest of honor. And he's invited in and he's the friend, he's the guest that is bestowing gifts upon. A big meal. Um, and so we're going to talk a little more about this. And if you look at David's account in Second Samuel 14 through 18, those chapters, you'll find out that even in the wilderness, while on the run, God provides for him a feast, provides for him provision in the middle of his enemies. God provides for him. So he says, the banquet and the feast is prepared in the midst of my enemy. You anoint my head with oil. So that was, that was etiquette. Okay, we have our etiquette in American culture. And so if you came into somebody's house now and you, you took some oil here, I got oil over there, and you wiped it on their head, they're probably thinking, what in the world are you doing, Right? Right? But um, in that culture, it, it was a sign of blessing. We're anointing your head with oil. All right? And um, it was common etiquette. It, you were the guest. You were friend. You were honored to be there. And then David says, my cup overflows. So it wasn't mean that the, the host didn't know how to pour, pour the beverage, right? It just meant that 
The cup never ran out. He had all he wanted to drink. He was satisfied. He was full. And so David concludes with the host is our friend. The host is our friend. And that's a reference that God is our friend. He's the host. That even in the difficult moments of life, he can provide for us and have his provision upon our life. And I think of David, he, he's running for his life. He doesn't know who to trust. And it is there, if you read the story, that it's unlikely people that really step up and, and provide for him and uh, welcome him. And God ends up winning. Um, Absalom would be killed, um, which was a sad, it was bittersweet because David wanted to be restored as king, but he also loved his son. Um, and God provided for him. You know what? God is able to provide for you in the difficult moments of life when it's difficult. Um, one of my favorite experiences was when I was in Jamaica in 2005. And it was my first missions trip. It could have been my last. There was two hurricanes that those two weeks I was there. Hurricane Dennis and then Hurricane, um, I believe it was... Um, Emily, if, if I'm not mistaken. Dennis went to the north and east of the island, and Emily came along the south of the island. So I was supposed to fly out on a Saturday, and guess what? That's when Emily was scheduled to come in. So they flew all the planes off the island. So I was stranded. There's no way to get off the island. And, and I, you know, I really didn't know anybody, and they drove me to Kingston, Jamaica, so I could get on my airplane. And I ended up staying with, um, kind of with two families, but they, uh, the husband and wife were in our Sunday school class in Springfield, Missouri. And um, so I think I stayed at Bruce's parents' house, and they just had a simple house there in Kingston, Jamaica. They actually, the parents actually just lived a couple blocks apart. But I stayed there, and, you know, I didn't know them. They, you know, I knew their son, but I didn't know them. But in the midst of a hurricane and all that was happening, they invited me in as their guest, and you know, I had the best fruit smoothies I've ever had there. They just took the fruit out of their backyard, made them up, and, and they treated me just as a friend, you know, as a special guest in their home. And that Saturday I was supposed to fly out. It just rained, rained, rained. We didn't get the wind. It stayed off far enough, you know, just rained, rained, rained. And, and God just, you know, I was kept safe. I was protected. And, and then uh, Sunday morning, then I got m one of the most... Um, nail-biting, white-knuckle rides to the airport in a taxi car. And um, somehow I made it into the airport. It was just all backed up, people were trying to get in. And I, I think I was in one of the first planes that got out of there. But the taxi driver somehow got his way through there. I mean, it, but I'm serious. I <laughs> he was driving crazy. All right. Um, but God watched out. You know, and I, I just think about that, that even in sometimes in the most um, interesting moments of life, well, when we're maybe even out of our comfort zone, God can provide for us. Um, in the valleys, God will provide for you because um, he's your shepherd and he's your host and he's going to look out over your life. And so David just didn't have, you know, he's not just out on a pasture one day and he writes this psalm thinking of the goodness of God. It appears that it came out of one of his most difficult moments in his life. And as he's reflecting back, he says, you know what? Man, the Lord is my shepherd. In the, in the darkest valley, he's there. And I, I didn't, even though I left with just a few provisions, I lacked nothing. God provided for me, and, and he protected me. He watched out over me. And even in the presence of my enemies, he, he, he was kind to me. And God would restore David back to the kingdom over time and would bring him back. He saw the goodness of God. I'm going to have the musicians come. The Lord is my shepherd. Amen. I hope that um, I hope that um, you've experienced that in your life, that you know Him as your Lord and your Savior, and because God has promised to be there for us, and you can't understand, you can't know the protection of God, the provision of God, unless you're walking with Him. He has to be your shepherd, right? If you're just going to be that lost sheep that just goes off and does its own thing, and he's still seeking after you.
but you're not going to know his protection and guidance because you're wandering. But Jesus said he's willing to leave the 99 behind to find the one, right? Maybe you're watching online this morning. Maybe, maybe you're here. Maybe you're that one that's just been straying. I don't know. I know a lot of you. But God wants to bring you back. He's our shepherd. We have to, we can enjoy his benefits when we surrender our lives to his leadership, his guidance in our life. Amen? Amen. Would you stand with me this morning? I always try to lead us in a prayer of salvation because I just never know if this might be somebody's day that today's the day that they invite Christ into their heart and their life. And so this morning, if if you want the promises that David talks about, you want to know the Lord in such a way that He's your friend, that He's the shepherd of your life, to know His protection, His goodness, um, you can know that today. And so I'm just going to lead us in a prayer of salvation, and I encourage all of us to say that together. So let's do that this morning. Say, Dear God, forgive me of my sin. Forgive me of my wanderings. Be my Lord and my Savior this morning. Let me know your mercy and your grace. And lead me in the everlasting way. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And Lord, this morning we just uh, lift up, I lift up each one here, Father. I pray that as we leave today, we can know that we're walking not just out alone, but we're walking with God. You're going with us. You're walking beside us, Lord God. You're watching over our lives. And there's Lord, there's times looking back, it's kind of like, wow, that just happened, that took place. And, and we look back and we say, man, God, you really protected me from that moment. You were watching over me. And so, Lord God, I just pray your hand upon each person here today. And in person and watching, we just pray your protection over our lives, Father. Lord, there is no fear, Lord God, because you're our shepherd. There's no fear. And Father, where fear exists, Lord, help us to trust you, to know that you are in control over our lives, over our family, over our communities, our nation, and over this world. You are in control. We can trust you. We can go to you in prayer. We can set our fears and anxiety aside and trust you, God. We ask this in the precious and the wonderful name of Jesus this morning. So I took Amy, I dropped her off, Panera there at, by Costco, and did a little shopping, and she was meeting somebody, and so I had a couple hours to kill, and so I took my time going through Costco and then um, headed towards Chick-fil-A to get something to eat. So I was right at that intersection 27th and Pine Lake there. So I'm in the left turn lane to turn into there. And there's this big Chevy pickup in front of me, kind of, you know, it's jacked up. And and uh, they have the music going. I could kind of hear it come some, but <laughs> these guys are just jamming to it. I mean, they're, they're so much so <laughs> that it's going like, that. man, they are just really, they're really pumped up. Well, the light turned green and they pulled ahead, but... The, the Toyota RAV4 in front of them must not have. They gunned it. I don't know. All I know is they boom, and all of a sudden, glass from the Toyota RAV4 comes flying over the pickup, you know, kind of comes right in front of me. And they totally just took out the back end of that Toyota RAV4. And, um, they had one of those cattle catchers on the front, so it didn't really hurt the pickup other than bend that back a little bit. And uh, you could tell the person in the Toyota RAV4 was pretty frustrated, but... You know, I could have been one or two more cars ahead and it could have been me that got impacted by that. So that I was behind there. You know, uh, I think there's so many times that God is watching out over our life. Uh, will you take a moment just as we go here just to thank God just as we go. Just take a moment and then I'm just going to close this with prayer. Just thank Him for this past week, maybe in the past couple days, his goodness. If he had food on the table, he had clothes to wear, you were healthy. Lord, go with us this day. And as we celebrate with Labor Day weekend tomorrow and today, 
Lord, just let your blessing be upon our families and our gatherings, Lord God. Uh, keep us safe. Thank you that you're our shepherd and provider and our host. And uh, you take such good care of us. And so, Lord God, as we surrender our lives, you will lack nothing, Lord. You're going to go with us, and there's no fear, Lord. And so go with us this week. Let your blessing go with us, and we give you the praise. We ask it in your name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Greet each other as you leave, and uh, have a blessed Labor Day weekend.